And welcome to The Gathering Online. My name is Maddie. I am the online pastor here, and I want to thank you for joining us in worship today. If you're new to our channel or you haven't done it yet, be sure to subscribe before you leave. Sermons like this one drop every Sunday are available on demand all week long, and we have other videos that roll out throughout the week. So by subscribing, that's how you know you won't miss anything. You can also go to the description of this video and click the link to learn more about our church through our website. Click a link to fill out a connect card, which gives me the chance to reach out and say hello, or click the link to give if that's something you're interested in doing today. Now we are still in our series screen time where we're talking about what it looks like to have a healthy relationship to the technology in our lives. I'm really excited about this series in part because I think there's a lot of it that is kind of um, impactful for me. There's a lot that I'm taking out of it as a value add and also um, because I think it's important to know that there is a way to have a healthy relationship to technology. There's some hope in that for me. I hope you find that hope in this message as well. Well, if you love it, share it with a friend, come back and watch it again, or comment down below and let us know what you enjoyed. Have a good time. Enjoy the message. Hey, everybody. My name is Tim Ziegler. I'm the site pastor here at McCausland as part of the gathering. I'm so glad that we could spend some time together here this morning or this afternoon or this evening or this night, wherever you find out about the gathering. I'm so glad that you linked up with us here today to check us out. In order to help coordinate school pickups, we instituted a rule a few years ago that the earliest anyone in our household could get a phone was their first year in middle school. So at the same time that our youngest joined the household text thread, great laughter erupted around the dining room table. There was some type of seriously toned conversation happening within the thread, and everybody responded with words of empathy and concern, except one. When confronted with why she was replying in such a caustic or careless manner, my spouse, Lisa, was caught off guard. What was she doing wrong? Each time someone mentioned something sort of heavy, she felt like she was being sympathetic. She was doing the right thing, but that's what was causing the laughter around the table. Lisa believed that every time she replied, and was saying, she was saying lots of love. The technocrati of our house found this so amusing and quickly informed her that LOL actually means laugh out loud. So when she thought she was being empathetic, they read it as a completely out of character thing, like why is mom laughing at this? Today we are continuing our conversation regarding screen time troubleshooting our relationship with technology by focusing on how technology can be a blessing or something not quite a blessing, especially when we get those acronyms wrong or those abbreviations. So far, we have been invited into a tech Sabbath, maybe a great band name, as we seek to be more mindful of the time we spend with our devices. And last week, we engaged in the notion of the dangers inherent in comparison culture, often experienced by our own teens through social media like Instagram. Pastor Matt provided us with an alternative understanding that we ought to ground ourselves in gratitude, thereby freeing us up and focusing on the gifts we have been given as opposed to comparing ourselves to others and what we do not have. It is worth saying again at the top here that technology is neither good nor evil. It is neutral. Technology is a tool that we can use it for good or evil. And both Scripture and Jesus have a lot to say about how we ought to use whatever resources are available to us in order to create life-affirming and positive relationships. One of my favorite Easter stories, and it's not too late to talk about Easter stories, even though it was a whole three weeks ago since we worshipped together as one site at the factory It's not too late because Easter is not just a day, but an entire season. One day can't contain all of the mystery and hope and new life that was there in the empty, but not so empty, tomb. So anyway, one of my favorite Easter stories involves two of Jesus' disciples deciding to skip town on what turned out to be Easter Day. Even though they have heard reports that the tomb was empty, they were getting out of Dodge or in this case, Jerusalem, perhaps thinking that they were next on the hit squad. 
These two are on their way toward the nearby town of Emmaus, and they are quickly joined by a stranger. Now, spoiler alert, we as the hearers of this story know that the stranger is actually the resurrected Christ, but they did not recognize him. And he asks his new traveling companions a question. What are you talking about as you walk along? They stopped, their faces downcast. Now, I don't know what type of phones they were looking at while they were walking that caused their faces to be downcast, or maybe more accurate to the times they were tablets. But the text makes a point to emphasize this in order to show how lost they felt. Their religious leader had just been executed. They were now without Jesus' leadership and friendship again, or so they thought, since the resurrected Jesus was the one asking them this very question. There was something interfering, though, with these two ability to see who was with them. Maybe it was their own depression. Maybe it was their inability to look up, to look forward. Maybe they were the first ones in history to suffer from some type of tech neck by looking down too much. Maybe their walking cadence resembled that of a dejected Charlie Brown, now showing at Webster Groves High School. Get your tickets now. I hear Lucy is great. Regardless, the traveling disciples are sad and grieving. In their continuing conversation, everything is phrased in the past tense, which culminates in the words found in verse 21, that we had hope. They don't know how to move forward. These two persons are seemingly encapsulated by the loneliness and isolation they've endured over the past three days. As citizens of the 21st century, we know all too well those feelings of isolation and loneliness. We know what it means to feel all alone. On countless occasions, we have looked for our salvation from these feelings and realities through technology, only to be disappointed time and time, and time again. When we aren't fully aware and present, it is far too easy to reduce people on screens to someone other. We seemingly all too easily forget their humanity. We reduce people to words typed on a Reddit thread. When we allow social media to reduce our humanity, we simply become avatars, and I'm not just talking about the Navi here, Couple this with the anonymity inherently present online, and it is a recipe for dehumanization. We feel it. We know that we are able to treat people more poorly online than IRL in real life. We're learning at the Ziegler House. We have been, or at least have known people who have been, on the receiving end of prejudgments layered upon other prejudgments. Someone new has been hired at work. Do some light internet stalking or sleuthing, depending on your perspective, and draw your own conclusions. Feel free to take those additional steps, draw your own conclusions, and make those prejudgments about that person even before they begin their new job. The promise of technology was to bring us closer together. Here we find it placing barriers between us, or maybe more appropriately, we unthinkingly put barriers between us when we use technology passively in our relationships. One of the things that gets nestled into all types of online media services is this idea that you are being sold something, that everything is being commoditized around us. If I were to say, hey, Siri, right now, and you know, go get Tim a cup of coffee, I don't know what would happen, but Maybe coffee would start popping up, or the next time we went to search for something, all of our ads would be flooded about coffee for this guy named Tim. So one of the questions I've begun asking myself is, what is trying to be sold here? These are a couple of my questions. Is it my connections with these other people? Is that trying to be commoditized somehow or marketed? Is it some type of product? And if I can't figure out exactly what is being sold, I begin to wonder, if I'm it, if I'm the product. When used passively, loneliness is one of the results, ironically, of our constantly interconnected relationships. Sometimes this is the result of feeling reduced to merely a thing to be marketed. 
Studies show that being treated as an avatar or as content ourselves often results in feelings of isolation. We are caught doing the work of processing others' prejudgments of ourselves, and we give it weight, maybe more than belongs. Sometimes this means that we physically withdraw from our regular day-to-day lives. Sticks and stones? Yeah, right. We are designed for empathy and to learn and form long-lasting relationships with others. We know that words do hurt and affect us. So when we feel rejected... Even by anonymous strangers, the results to ourselves and those we love can be devastating to our mental, emotional, and physical selves. Physical health as well. There was a time in the Gospel of Matthew when Jesus is sending his disciples out two by two and instructs them that in those places where their message is being rejected, that they ought to shake the dust off of their sandals and split. Taylor Swift, anybody? Shake it off. This shows that that sometimes there is more wisdom in leaving once rejected than in staying around and absorbing more rejections. Sometimes opting out is the bigger win. So that app, it's no longer working for you. Hide it. Delete it. Unregister from it. There are certain apps that I have given up over time, Facebook and Twitter among them, My Facebook here I use specifically to get to know people in our church, not to connect with folks from high school, but that's just me. That's just a barrier or a boundary that I put up for myself, and that's what works for me. What happened in the past was I would find myself doing the doom-scrolling thing and not really interacting with those persons around me, but more content just to be sucked in and absorbed by my screen. And so I I I knew I needed to stop. So I only have Facebook access on my iPad, and I check it maybe a couple of times a week at most. And this actually helps me be more present in the here and now. Perhaps you've noticed, as Sarah Rugenstone, our Clayton site pastor, once did, when she tagged some other Tim Ziegler in a staff photo that I'm not on Instagram. And that's by choice. It's a boundary. It might not make sense for others, but right now it's what works for me as I try to be more and more present with those I am physically present with. There's a word in Greek, alaleon, which shows up a hundred times over the course of 94 verses in the New Testament. Here we can read a hundred different ways in which we are meant to interact with one another. It means one another, this word, alaleon. We are instructed to love one another. And in the Gospel of John, this is probably the most famous instance of this idea of how we should treat one another. Jesus gives a new commandment. I give you a new commandment, love each other just as I have loved you, so you also must love each other. This is how everyone will know that you are my disciples when you love each other. There it's repeated a couple of times. How we treat one another in our relationships is based on Jesus' own love for us. This ought to be the way in which we are able to intentionally interact with one another all of the time, that we can be aware of one another's full humanity and sacred divine worth. We are known by this love, not by being right all of the time, but of demonstrating the love of God for strangers, neighbors, and family alike. This commandment is actually not new. It had been around in Scripture for thousands of years as a command, too. What is new is the acknowledgement that we have all fallen short of this great love. What is new is that the Savior of the world is now showing us what this love looks like in the flesh. What is new is that we have been freed to love like Jesus loves. Technology has the ability to bring us together in amazing ways, creating new connections across time and space unlike anything in human history. Yet it is not our salvation, but it also is not our destruction. If we were to fill out our social media profile in an attempt to describe our relationship with screens and tech, certainly the vast majority of us would have to click the it's complicated box. It is complicated. The truth is, however, that we are not products. We are not things. We are loved creations of God, created in God's own image. We are image bearers. We are more than what some anonymous stranger says we are. You are already loved. 
you were already known. You have been created not just to be an influencer, but to be influenced by Jesus and his great love so that you might in turn influence others in that same way, rooted in love. A few weeks ago, I was describing our five shared practices with someone interested in membership. In describing the very first one, worship, I kept getting questions as to what we mean. Finally, the person I'm chatting with has a tremendous insight because they clearly saw what I was saying was not connecting. They looked at me and said, do you just mean go to church? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that is what we mean. When we talk about worship, we do mean go to church. Just this past week, the Wall Street Journal posted an article describing the mental health benefits of going to church. This is huge. We feel more connected and we have a deeper sense of belonging. One of the best antidotes to this technology epidemic of loneliness is to show up for one another, live and online, as the church. And herein we discover an ancient understanding of these very principles and healthy practices. Before there was a name for church, it was just called ecclesia, which means the gathering. Does that sound familiar? It was a place not just to go once a week, but it existed inside and outside of buildings wherever two or more folks would get together. And there they would see each other, actually see each other. They would get to know one another, and they would often share a meal together. Speaking of which, I don't want to leave you hanging about these two disciples accompanied by the risen Christ on their way to Emmaus. The next thing that happens is that Jesus is like, okay, I'm going to dip out of here. And the other two were like, no, wait, come and stay with us. So he does. And when they arrive at the place where they were going, Jesus takes his seat at the table, still unknown. He picks up the bread, blesses it, breaks it, and shares it with them. Immediately, they see him for who he is. But he disappears. And they head back to Jerusalem to reassert the claims of resurrection made earlier. In showing up for worship, we are seen. In showing up in core groups, we are known. And in the breaking of the bread, we know that we are already accepted, already loved, already known, and seen by the one who surprises us along our paths. After all, You are not a product. You are a person. You are a person of divine worth, loved, called, and claimed by a God who sees and knows you as a divine image bearer. Let us pray. Gracious God, we're so thankful that we are able to think upon these words here today, that we are more than who folks in the world say that we are. We are indeed loved, created claimed and named by you. Help us learn more of what that means for us this day and help us to share it and invite others into that same life through Christ. Amen. 